A very good morning to everyone, and uh, we are very happy to have you here this morning. Uh, I was thinking about the completion of the uh, Common Spirit Health um, Physician and Advanced Practice My Voice survey that has just been completed. Results yet uh, under wraps, but we should hear about them soon. Um, and, and this is a series of conversations that we have been having about uh, professional fulfillment, well-being for physicians and APPs, uh, our three uh, subcommittees that I think most people are aware of and the work that is taking place, um, that has been taking place over the last several months and, and will continue going forward. Uh, we have um, a guest speaker this morning, Dr. Dai um, Thompson, who uh, I think some of you may be familiar that um, Common Spirit Health um, uh, is reorganizing its uh, relationship with Centura Health and Centura Health uh, will just become part of Common Spirit. And Dr. Thompson is the um, uh, Enterprise Director for Physician and Advanced Practice Wellbeing at uh, Centura. And uh, she has um, 20 years of uh, psychiatric experience as a professional not personal, um, uh, working with physicians and leadership to improve well-being. Um, uh, she leads training programs for physicians and advanced practice providers to become peer coaches and engages in other well-being programs to further engage and support physicians and APPs and the APP community. Um, also joining us are members of the steering committee of our well-being and professional fulfillment committee that lives under the uh, Common Spirit Health uh, Physician and APP Experience and Engagement uh, Council. And uh, first, uh, Greg Anderson, uh, Dr. Greg Anderson, who is an adult neurologist and neurophysiologist in Lexington, uh, Kentucky. And Greg was one of the first persons that I met uh, at a meeting that we had in Las Vegas for um, uh, Common Spirit Health when it came together. He serves as the uh, Medical Director of Quality in the Kentucky market. He's a co-leader of the Southeast Division for Ambulatory uh, and co-leads the Common Spirit Health Physician Engagement Council on uh, Physician and APP Engagement um, for Well-Being and Fulfillment uh, with the rest of our, uh, with me and uh, works, of course, on the steering committee. Uh, he told me at that very first meeting, he has had a long uh, interest and passion for engagement and well-being of physicians and APPs uh, locally and throughout Common Spirit, and he's been a great partner. Um, Next, we have Ann Wright, uh, who is a physician assistant by clinical background and training. Uh, she's worked for 20 years in the Sacramento area in general orthopedics, orthospine, primary care, pain management, OBGYN, uh, urgent care, and clinical research. Sounds like a family practice person to me. Um, Ann has a deep passion for sustaining the delivery of healthcare by stabilizing our teams through evidence-based well-being initiatives and, and uh, that address the specific and unique needs of our physician and APP colleagues. And she is a co-leader of, of a group that is working to sort of streamline, uh, I, I call it for short, I don't get a headache at work uh, committee to uh, make care more seamless at, uh, in the office. Um, and last, um, uh, Dr. Barbara Martin, who is a nurse practitioner with over 20 years clinical um, and leadership excellent in healthcare delivery, uh, policy and research. She received her master's degree in public health in 2013 um, and uh, served as the executive director of a federally funded statewide healthcare initiative, transforming care focused on practice redesign in Colorado. Uh, Dr. Martin received her PhD in nursing health systems research in the spring of 2020, we all remember that, uh, and has uh, focus, in a focused role of advanced practice providers in value-based um, delivery. Uh, she was appointed the system senior vice president for advanced practice in June of 2001. And also uh, here this morning, uh, welcoming back uh, Dr. Ankita Sagar uh, and um, uh, Brooke Burgess from Communications. So with that, Dr. Thompson, we are extremely happy to have you with us this morning and look forward to your comments. And we're going to turn it over to you. I would remind people uh, questions can either go in the Q&A in the chat, and uh, we look forward to hearing from folks. Wonderful. Good morning, everyone. Um, again, I'm Di Thompson, and I am very much looking forward to this grand rounds today. Uh, well-being for physicians and APP is my passion, and I'm super excited to talk about it. 
Before I um, really dive in, I just wanted to give you a little bit of an overview of what we're doing at Centura right now. We're always looking for improvements. Uh, one of the, the biggest things that we do is our peer coach training, and that's what I'll be talking to you about a little bit more in detail uh, today. Our program uh, also has a 24-hour confidential provider line for all physicians and APPs on medical staff. So that's both those that are employed as well as those that are aligned. And then we also do one-on-one -on -one coaching. Uh, I primarily lead, primarily lead this uh, coaching physicians and also see them uh, as psychiatric patients when needed. I do have several other members of my team that do the one-on-one -on -one coaching as well. And we also have group sessions for physician partners in hospitals or clinics. Sometimes there are issues uh, within a group and we help to uh, help them come up with solutions. Um, we also have our employee assistance program for our uh, CHPG uh, physicians and APPs. We do an annual well-being survey. This year, we're switching to the Mini-Z, uh, but in the past, we've used the MASLOC, and I'll be talking about that, as well as an annual wellness conference. All righty. So just to start off, I'd love to take a uh, survey. What do you think? Since 2019, have rates increased or decreased with regard to burnout? We'll give everybody another minute to chime in. I'd say from the looks of what we see so far, just about everybody, in fact, everybody, uh, thinks that the rates have increased. It's no surprise that they've increased during COVID, right? Um, but the other piece of this is that they continue to increase. All right. Next slide, please. So I'm going to be talking a little bit later about what we found as far as data regarding the Maslow burnout scale at Centura. And I wanted to start by explaining what the kind of gold standard of uh, burnout is uh, based on the Maslow scale. And there are really three different dimensions uh, to burnout. The first is emotional exhaustion, and this is actually feeling both physically and emotionally just drained, wiped out, tired. Depersonalization is particularly concerning to me, and that's when providers start to feel callous, sarcastic, they get resentful, numb. They might hear some really sad news from a patient and just not be able to empathize. And then lastly is personal accomplishment. So in the ideal situation, we have low scores on emotional exhaustion and depersonalization and high scores on personal accomplishment, meaning that we feel good at the end of the day, like we've accomplished something and what we did was really worthwhile. So I'll return to those uh, three dimensions a little bit later, but I just wanted to give you a background and remind you what the most common symptoms of burnout are. So this is serious. Um, in fact, even the uh, Surgeon General has announced that this is a crisis and we need to do something right now. So I'd like to share with you one of the things that we did, um, and I have some data to back it up as well. So this is how it started. With Centura, there are um, 19 hospitals uh, right now in the system. And I initially started at one of those hospitals that is going to become more closely affiliated with Common Spirit, and that's Penrose St. Francis. At Penrose St. Francis in 2015, uh, we decided to bring in a speaker that was going to talk to us about physician burnout and well-being. 
my concern at that time was that this was going to be another great speaker that was going to tell us we needed to do more yoga and take more vacations. And it seemed to me that there's more to it than that. I requested um, that about 30 physicians in all different specialties join me one evening after work at the hospital to talk about what else we can do. What should we really at, at the ground level be doing for our physicians? This is my favorite story because of those 30, 28 showed up, which as you know, is, is quite unusual for physicians. And that really sent the message that physicians, APPs believe that this is a problem and that we need to do something to address it. So as we met as a group, we talked about, well, what, what would be important? What would be helpful? And what they all requested was a way to learn how and be more comfortable supporting their colleagues when they noted that they were in distress. Next slide. And that is what led to our physician coaching program. And our physician coaching program really is all about empowering physicians and APPs to make a difference. I remember at that uh, meeting, I asked if anyone knew or had any experience with a colleague who committed suicide. And so many of them raised their hands. They, they knew someone um, and were very troubled by this and really wanted to do something not only to help with that very serious issue, but also to help others that were just struggling. So we developed this program, which basically has uh, four pillars. When we talk about physician and APP wellness and what we can do for others, the first thing that I always stress is before we can do that, we need to take care of ourselves. So the most important thing when we start the training is talking with our physicians and APPs about what they're doing for their own self-care. The second part of our program is actually helping them recognize what distress looks like in their colleagues. I'm sure you can imagine that it can look a lot different in one person versus another. Um, some people might be loud and complaining, um, but sometimes people might just get really quiet, um, and that actually is more concerning. On day two of our coach training, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we do this, we actually have mock sessions where the physicians and APPs work together to practice uh, coaching with each other. And then lastly, we really focus on making them feel comfortable that they don't have to be everything for everyone and know all the answers. Um, so we give them a lot of references and support for those cases where they feel like this is something that I'm not comfortable with or this person needs a little bit more support than I can give them. Next slide. So let's take a deep dive um, and talk a little bit more about the, the who, the how, the where, and the why. So who. So our program is for physicians and advanced practice providers. I've been asked by nursing uh, why we aren't doing this for nursing as well, and I would love to expand it uh, to this, but for now, uh, our our program is primarily for physicians and advanced practice providers. And they're selected uh, by their colleagues, by medical directors, by their CMOs, chiefs of staff, and also through peers who have gone through the peer coach uh, training program. At the end of each uh, training, we ask uh, those that have gone through the training to write down names and suggestions of people that they would recommend uh, for the program. So what kind of 
person are we looking for? Well, we're looking for someone who's engaged, who's interested in well-being. And so many physicians are. And that's the wonderful part of this. People that you might not suspect unless you ask really want to learn how to better support their colleagues. And this uh, is a program that we offer both to our employed and private practice uh, medical staff. In each of our cohorts, which average about 10 to 12, sometimes we do bigger, bigger groups, um, we, we really strive to have multiple specialties um, at each cohort. And I think this is especially important because physicians that might not know each other uh, but have worked together for years on some level, really get a chance to meet and connect. Next. And this is the how. Uh, I have here just an example of a letter that we uh, send as a calendar invitation and an email to those physicians and APPs that are selected for the program. Um, and some of you may be on smaller uh, devices, so I'll just uh, read this to you. Um, Dear physicians and advanced practice providers, we are happy to announce that we are gearing up uh, to commence a peer coach training cohort at, in this case, it was St. Anthony's Hospital, and you have been identified as an excellent candidate for this training program, and we are inviting you to be part of the program. Please note, the training does not assign you to a specific peer. Rather, it increases awareness and comfort in supporting your colleagues as you see fit. Our initial cohorts have been a huge success and consist of over 150 of your peers throughout Centura. Please contact Dr. Di Thompson with any questions and please save the dates. Next slide. So the where and the when. Oftentimes we do this at the hospital in a boardroom or conference room just because it's convenient for, for physicians. Usually we start the training at the end of the day, 5 or 5.30, and for many uh, it's hard for them to run out to another uh, venue. Although we have done this in restaurants, in clubhouses, and sometimes it's nice to take, take it off the campus. Um, it all depends on what uh, that hospital uh, thinks is going to be most helpful for them. Uh, and we do do this primarily during the week on evenings, uh, but sometimes we've done it on Saturday mornings as well, as long as it's not soccer season or some other uh, time when physicians are especially busy with their kids. Next slide. So, as I've talked a little bit about what the program looks like, and I will uh, give you some more information about it as well, uh, just a question. On a scale of one to five, how important do you think it is for physicians to have community within their practices or groups? I see here it says host and panelists cannot vote. Not sure what's going on there. John, do we? Oh, oh here we go. Perfect. Oh, they did vote. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, it is important. Um, and it, it looks like everyone agrees with that. Let's go to the next slide and I'll talk a little bit more about that. It's actually pivotal uh, for physicians uh, and APPs. 90% of physicians queried in a, a, a survey said that they are going to talk to a colleague much more often than talking to any other uh, person or seeking any other forms of support. And I see that over and over again in the peer coach training. Um, I hear physicians say, you know, this is great because I'm not going to talk to my spouse. I'm not going to burden them. My friends don't understand. I'm not going to go to a therapist who doesn't get it. My colleagues get it. This is going to work. 
And of those that had gone through the coaching experience in another study said that they're more likely to stay in their position because of the peer coach training and they would absolutely recommend it to their colleagues. It works. Next slide. So here's my data about the fact that it really does work. Um, each year we do the Maslow burnout scale. And last year for the first time we asked as they were doing the scale, if they had gone through the coaching program or not. And what we can see here is that for the physicians that filled out the Maslow uh, burnout scale, who also noted that they had gone through the peer coaching pro program, they had much lower rates of emotional exhaustion and depersonalization and felt better about their jobs at the end of the day with higher levels of personal accomplishment. Next slide, please. So we know that coaching is good for the coaches, but is it also good for physicians and APPs in general at the hospitals? Now, this is a very busy slide, but I'd ask you to just uh, kind of look at the green and light colors as opposed to the red. The red is basically what we don't wanna see. The green is what we do wanna see. And if we could move to the next slide, I'll explain a little bit about this. Of the hospitals that we surveyed, there were three that really stood out. And the big three hospitals that tended to do the best with regards to their burnout scores were hospitals that had either had the longest running peer coach programs um, or the, the most peer coach programs, the number of, of people who had gone through the program, particularly St. Anthony North that includes, and this is always a nice reminder for me, both uh, physicians, APPs and residents, as well as Penrose St. Francis had significantly lower rates of emotional exhaustion than the other hospitals. St. Thomas More had low, the lowest rates of depersonalization. And all three of those hospitals had the highest rates when it comes to the personal accomplishment. Next slide. Uh, we were so excited about our data that we, uh, talk to Beckers about it, and they actually published uh, our, our data. And one of the, the interesting things, as we saw uh, when I did that survey, was that burnout rates have increased, and they definitely have increased nationally. Um, the most recent study was by Shauna Felt uh, that looked at late 2021 and 2022 data over 4,300 physicians nationwide. And those physicians actually had an increase in their emotional exhaustion by 30% over the last two years. And depersonalization was increased by 60%. That is scary. Fortunately, one of the things that uh, we found at Centura was that we did not have those increases that we're seeing nationwide. Uh, and I can't say that it's all due to our well being program, but I really do think that that plays a, a role in this. Next slide. So this slide is. Uh, a question for you all. Um, and then I'll tell you why I have the uh, farmer's market um, on the other side. Question, um, peer coaching, mentoring, being a support, are they basically all the same thing? What do you think? And as you're filling that out. The reason why I have this slide here is because uh, I really wanted to stress that our program is organic. Um, it, it has grown um, based on the enthusiasm of the, the peer coaches who've gone through the program. And one of the nice things that I really want to stress about this program is each coaching session is organic. It depends on the individual who's being coached and the coachee when, where it happens, how many times it happens, 
Um, and it can differ. Um, someone might just need one very brief encounter with a coach uh, to get themselves back on the right track. Others might want to meet more frequently. And what do we see here? You are absolutely correct. Uh, they, there really is a difference. So the difference is that with a mentor, that's someone who basically helps and really guides you uh, as to what you can do to further your, uh, usually your career. Um, it may mean introducing you to uh, other people, helping you write articles, um, perhaps even mentoring in the uh, OR or mentoring in the clinic. Peer coaching is a little bit different because it really is about helping that physician or APP come to their own conclusions about what is going to be most helpful for them and how they would like to move forward. And in both cases, certainly uh, there is support, but both peer coaching and mentoring are a, a little bit more active than uh, someone just saying, hey, good job. Next slide. So as a recap of our coaching program, I just wanted to give you a, a few more of the, the details about it. Again, they uh, these two program, the two training days happen uh, usually in the evenings, and they're divided by about a month. The reason we do this is we want to uh, give the people that are going through the peer coach training some time to percolate uh, what they've learned and uh, then come back that second for the second training with some ideas and perhaps some experiences that they've had uh, after their first training session. On the first training session, we really, again, focus on self-care. We do not want people trying to coach their peers uh, if they're having a bad day. Um, and then uh, we also work a lot on communication skills, what to say and what not to say. Um, and then recognizing uh, distress and how to approach uh, people who are just not acting like themselves or who might be acting uh, inappropriately. The second evening uh, is where we review the, the skills that we learned on the, the first day of training. And then we break out into uh, smaller groups and do the role playing. Uh, and this is really fun and a great experience uh, oftentimes I'll hear uh, the, the trainees tell me that this is a lot harder than they thought it was going to be. As physicians, we're used to fixing problems. And as a coach, the idea is not to fix the problem, but to walk with your colleague as they come up with solutions uh, to the issues. We have a little pinning ceremony where everyone gets uh, a little uh, pin that says coach on it. Uh, some people wear these on their white coats. Uh, and then we have alumni events, either formal or informal throughout the year, uh, as well as a quarterly coach meeting where we have a Zoom session. Anybody can hop in and either discuss cases uh, or uh, share ideas and experiences that they've had. Uh, we do give CME um, and they get two hours for each of the evenings. So that is uh, my recap. I did also want to um, really focus on the idea of well, what do we do if things are too, too difficult? Um, if I don't feel comfortable. And that's where we offer resources. There are multiple resources that we offer. First, we offer our physician uh, and APP uh, well-being line, as well as uh, contacting me personally. I give out my cell phone number to all of the people that go through the uh, peer coach training. We also have Colorado-based uh, programs. There's the Colorado Physician Health Program. And then there are national resources, too, if someone doesn't feel comfortable uh, working within uh, the hospital system and wants uh, to work outside of that, uh, we help uh, navigate with that as well. 
I believe that is the last slide, and I'm looking forward to uh, the panel and, and seeing Great. what sure. questions and solutions you all have. Yes, here, here they are. Um, and um, I'm, and uh, there is one question in the chat, which will in the question and answer, but if people have other questions as well, um, uh, that would be great. Um, John has put another reminder in about CME. Thank you. That was great. Um, maybe I'll, I'll start um, uh, with uh, at least one question. I have a couple more, but one question is, Di, have, what about, have you collected any information um, about uh, if I were to have taken this course, my willingness to intercede? So here I am walking down the hall and I took that course and is it like, I just kind of keep going or do I like, go, you know, I got to step up to the plate here. So what would you say about that? We haven't queried specifically. Um, we do do a survey uh, at the end of day two training and ask questions to help us improve the program. I would say if someone is interested enough to engage in the training, go through the training and feel comfortable uh, with the skills that they've learned, it's much easier for them to do that. Um, and we do spend a lot of time talking about uh, when and where. Um, so when you feel like it's a good time and also someplace where there aren't a lot of other people around, uh, where they you might pull someone into a room or mm -hmm. um, say, hey, can we grab a coffee later? I really wanna talk to you and see how you're doing. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay, other I've, I've got a few more, but I won't monopolize the, the time. So um, questions from the panel, um, or otherwise I've got some questions in the Q&A. Di, I'll, I'll start. Um, I really appreciate what you've done. It's, 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 hundreds of coaches have been trained to have a, a really big impact. And you know this works really well and fits well with what we're doing with Common Spirit that we've been working on the last few years uh, with an engagement council and well-being committee. And um, maybe we thought we'd just maybe just highlight for folks on the, on the um, on the panel or the group today listening that just a bit about what we do and what we have done, what we are trying to do. Um, I don't know, John, if you've got a couple of slides you can pull just to um, just to highlight some of those things. So just 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 a couple of minutes on this. As I, I really like, and kind of the thrust of what we've done is based upon the fact that there is a system problem. I love the way you started out with the solution is not doing a little bit more yoga and and taking more vacations and just being healthier yourself. Um, I like the analogy that you may have heard of of the um, the, the problem is with the soil we we live in. Um, we have, as, as physicians and APPs, and we've been through medical school and training, and we've learned to be resilient. We've learned a lot. We're capable people. But we're, we're, we seek to thrive in the soil we were planted in, which is our local practice setting or hospital. But the problem is not, but the problem with burnout is not that we are weak people or weak plants. The problem is the soil in healthcare is very difficult to thrive in. And that's a thrust of this is just the rocks and all sorts of other things in the soil. And sometimes the soil is just plain toxic. And that's why it's so hard to thrive. And that's what drives burnout. So that's a really important message that um, we seek to change the system, to encourage other leaders in our system to, to do the right things to help improve the our environment, our soil that we live in. So that kind of is a driving thinking behind the work we've done. So we started this um, physician enterprise. It's a physician and APP and engagement experience council. And there's several components. I won't go to in detail, but there is um, a section on um, a work group on culture and mission trying to help the other subgroups think in terms of the mission and why are we doing things and to drive that to our, our local markets. We have an onboarding and mentoring work group uh, led by Ann Wright. And that's uh, rolled out a couple of pilots of the mentoring programs um, that, that are just getting started and um, have done some great work on that. The Physician APP Leadership Development Academy 
has been greatly successful. Um, Dr. Marika Gray and Margaret Cecil led that, and we are now starting our third year cohort of physicians and APP trainees in that um, in that training that training program, which has just been really successful and really valuable to people. Then, more recently, we started this Well-Being and Professional Fulfillment Committee, and um, this group on this panel was basically the leadership team. And John, if you want to show one more slide of just a breakdown of that. So it, it, some of what this group is doing is right along with what Di was talking about, um, the sense of building community and connectedness, uh, commensality programs, meeting together as groups and small groups, even individuals or pairs uh, for a lot of, just building a sense of community, the fact I'm not in this by myself and we help each other and pull each other up. Optimizing clinical care delivery is recognizing all the rocks and pebbles that are in the soil and what can we do to remove some of those rocks in the EHR, in the way things are done, in the um, credentialing process and so many areas. So that, that work group is working on what can be done in the local market, in your clinics, in your hospitals to make life better. Um, and finally, the peer coaching the peer coaching and support, um, and we're focusing really more on a peer support program, um, which is probably a little less intense than a peer than a coaching program, but a lot of the same concepts that Dr. Thompson just described to us, and that is also um, anticipated to have a rollout with the first group probably in the Omaha region in this fall. So that's the kind of work that we're doing, and. Uh, and you can take the slides off, John. So, but the, the goal is to make this happen and be meaningful at the local level. And I mean, we're, we're looking at a national group because we're trying to develop programs, but it, it can't stay at the national level. If you're interested in working in any of the work groups, let us know. If you're interested in bringing some of this type of activity into your markets, let us know. Um, but thinking in terms of just how do we make this personal, what does it feel like to do these programs? I wonder if Dr. Thompson, you could maybe just give us uh, an example or a story of the work you did and do. Is there a way or as an example of maybe something that was really um, successful, really made an impact on someone's well-being and, and sense of fulfillment in their work by virtue of being involved in that kind of program? Sure. Um if I can, I'll tell you two stories, one about uh, two uh, physicians that went through the peer coaching program. Um, because there are all these different specialties, uh, people, for example, um, in the emergency uh, department and a hospitalist might talk on the phone for years, but never really get to know each other, right? So with the peer coaching program, one of the uh, peer coaches on day two came back and said, I just have to say, I had such a great experience with Dr. John the other day. Um, it was the middle of the night. Things were absolutely crazy. The ED doc calls and says to the hospitalist, look, hey, it's Dr. John, I really need you to admit this patient. Hospital is overloaded, but hospital says, hey, Dr. John, it's Dr. Smith. We did the coach training together. How are you? And it ends up that they have this really nice, brief conversation that is so much more supportive, feels good. So when they get off the phone, despite the fact that they're both really working hard, they've got this connection um, and feel good about each other. As far as people that have been coached, I have had people come up to me that have been coached by others that say, I couldn't have got through that lawsuit if it hadn't been for my working with Dr. Brock. Um, and I've had physicians who say, you know what, after doing some one-on-one -on -one coaching with you, um, I've decided I really do like my job and I'm not going to go open up a bike shop, which is a particularly, I don't know if that's national, but it's a Colorado thing. That's one of the fantasies physicians tend to have. Um, and they're able to uh, find that meaning um, 
back in their work. That's great. Um, let's say we have some questions in the in the chat. Um, and I'll, I'll just quickly run through these. The first one, is there any precedent for doing the training during business hours, i.e. not nights and weekends? And I know your program is sort of <clears throat> a hybrid of starting a bit earlier in the afternoon, four or five, and, and then into the evening. And so what would you say about that? Right. Um, we, we really had the request from physicians and APPs that they can't give up time uh, during their work day. Um, as if, if there is a group that's willing to do that, boy, that would be great because I would love people to have free time during their evenings. Um, at this point, um, we are doing it during the day. I, I'm sorry, during the evenings, just because of physician and APP schedules. Um, okay, that, that's great. Um, uh, and, and and I know I know you meant we've talked mainly about physicians. I know you mentioned physicians and APPs, and I, I think well, obviously our our program is focused on both physicians and APPs, and all of the committees that Greg talked about are are co-chaired by physicians and, and APPs. Um, there's another one. How does one access the resources to provide training? Who does this in person and online? And and, it, and before you answer, I'm also just going to say that. Uh, Greg really talked about um, kind of reaching out and and kind of moving what we've done kind of nationally to prepare into our various markets. And so we are starting a pilot um, uh, peer, peer support program training uh, in Omaha this fall, I think September. Um, uh, and that will be our first launch. Uh, and following that, what we hope to launch it in several of the common spirit markets across the country. Um, so I, so I, I, I think one way to say this would be coming uh, to, uh, to a, um, uh, a station near you. But um, and if people uh, from who are on this call would like their markets to be volunteer subjects, um, we, 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 it would be worthwhile reaching out to myself and Greg and uh, others on the call, and we'll make that happen, um, uh, Doctor. And so, uh, Di, any comments about that more? Um, uh, and this is about accessing the program. Yeah, it's uh, who does who does the training? Is it in person and on or online? Yes. Um, so all of the training has been in person, except during COVID, we did one or two online, and surprisingly, that worked really well. But there's nothing better than being in person. Yeah. Um, and as far as who does the training, uh, I'm very fortunate to have a team that's made up of members, both physicians, APPs, uh, and others um, that are uh, within the hospital uh, administration, including someone from our HR HRO uh, program, as well as um, from our EAP. Usually we have uh, two or three, sometimes even four, uh, trainers uh, that attend the sessions as um, each time. Um, great. Okay. And and I would just say that our, our first kickoff will be virtual um, and we are putting, assembling a group of uh, trainers um, uh, from various markets. And we hope Dr. Thompson, you'll help us with that as well. And um, uh, so, so we are, we're getting our, if I can say faculty together, um, as we speak. And uh, I, I want to just, um, uh, there's a few more questions for you, Di, and I also just want to uh, put uh, Barbara Martin and Anne Wright on the spot a little bit. And from your perspective, Barbara and Anne, how do you see this work um, benefiting the relationship, the fact that APPs and physicians will train together and that same thing may happen like, oh, we were in the training together. Uh, so I just wonder what you're thinking, you know, what you are both thinking about that and Di, your, your experience in terms of physicians and APPs. Thanks, Dr. Greenswag. I will actually defer to Anne since she's been so passionately leading this work for us. So I will give her the floor. Oh, thanks, Barbara. Um, you know, I think there's a couple of things. We invoke um, Dr. Tate Shanafield's work around here quite a bit, as I'm sure most people do. And he had he's published uh, these really beautiful wheels that talk about the relative importance of stressors and how they differ by profession or occupation. 
And when we look at physicians, you know, I look for unique things in the population. And so for our physicians, isolation is one that stands out for them. And for our APPs, role clarity is one that stands out for them. Mm-hmm. And so where I see this intersecting is it really helps to your point, Dr. <laughs> Thompson, talking about physicians or APPs that interact with each other, but don't have that face-to-face time. You know, we see folks spending less time having lunch together, being in communal spaces together. When we offer those things to them, they're too busy. They can't take time away from patient care, right? So for both of those populations, being able to train together, having that the interactions to side by side help out with the isolation and also help with the role clarity, I think it serves both purposes. Um, and that's what I see with mentoring or any of these other things where we really understand we're comrades in arms, we're shoulder to shoulder in the trenches, and that the roles are very complementary and, and can be really powerful um, when they're collaborative together. Di, any thoughts? Yes, yes, I totally agree with that. Um, We have residents, we have APPs, and we have physicians all working together. Uh, And when we have these training sessions, we always have uh, a nice dinner um, during that, where they can really just sit and and get to know each other, uh, discuss things. It makes for such a comfortable situation the next time they talk again uh, in the hospital. Uh, We end each of the sessions uh, by, actually on the first day, by uh, standing in kind of a circle and saying, you know, what did you experience today? Um, How do you feel about it? And over and over again, I hear uh, the people that are going through the training say things like, I never realized how cool some of these people were. Um, These are great people. And it's just fun to be able to uh, allow them to develop those relationships and real appreciation for each other. Oh, that's that's great. Uh, And there are, there are two questions in the chats about residents. Um, and uh, I, I would um, uh, I, actually, Ankara, I see you. You uh, have a comment, and and I would just say, uh, if residents are at your facility, they're they're part of the team, and and uh, we we need to find a way to include them. But Ankara, what were you going to say about that? Yeah, I was going to say similarly. Um, you know, the the AAMC and also the ACGME has really come down on the issue of well being in residency. Um, because it really starts with med school, right? The undergraduate medical education and so on and so forth. So I think it's a it's a key aspect um, because sometimes our residents and our fellows in training tend to be isolated in very similar ways that Anne just mentioned earlier. Um, great. And I want to just be sure we get um, uh, get through our questions. Um, Ann um, Curry made a comment about the Southwest Division having a physician and APP support training program uh, uh, led by Heather um, Rabin, Dr. Heather Rabin. And just to say that Heather certainly is working with our team and actually a member um, of the uh, peer supporting um, coaching team uh, and will be faculty for what we are putting together for Omaha this fall. So um, yeah, we're, we're happy to have Heather and other folks as well who will be doing that work. Um, there's two more questions. Uh, one question, um, uh, Peter, you, I think you're on and you may have some uh, uh, comments as well, John, if we can have Peter uh, hooked into our chat or our conversation. But um, these programs, I think, have typically been hospital-based, uh, and many times it, the organized medical staff, and in Arizona, I think it's a combination. Um, but I think having said that, we, uh, as the physician enterprise, we are really focusing um, uh, on those people that are employed by us, and that includes the, our clinic and ambulatory physicians and APPs. Um, but I, I think we are still balancing that. Uh, and there is another question from um, uh, Michael Corp- Corpiel. I think I've got that right. Uh, and um, uh, I think that, um, uh, you know, in terms of the hospital president, Michael, I'm glad you asked the question. And, and I would suggest um, a reaching out uh, to um, uh, your medical staff leaders and also your um, uh, physician enterprise uh, ambulatory medical group to bring them together and ask them this very question about what they're doing and how can you be supportive and, and uh, as you know from our well-being summit from our summit clinical summit that we had uh, last year um, we really reached out to hospital presidents 
to take an active role. And I, I really appreciate the question. And I think Ankit has got a comment about that as well. Uh, I was just going to say, I believe Dr. Bigler has joined our panel. Yes, okay. Uh, all right, so Michael, um, thank you. And um, we'd be happy to follow up with you offline about that. And Peter, uh, any thoughts? I think we are really balancing between the medical staff and those um, people who are uh, in our employed groups. Uh, and, and because it's physician enterprise, it's not that we're picking on the medical staff, but I do think that the focus will be to start uh, in the physician enterprise. And there is a bit of a difference um, in that uh, if, if you are a member of an employed group, uh, we have responsibility for your work environment uh, 24 hours a day, um, uh, seven days a week, uh, and your clinic and your staff, uh, your ease of use, all of those things. And so part of our work is focusing at Anne uh, and Dr. Gray are, are leading a group about how do we create less headaches in the office. And, and so I, I think the primary focus will be there, but but, but, but we need to figure out, and there is a group called the, uh, the NPEC, National Physician and APP Engagement uh, Council. And uh, uh, several of us, Greg, Ankur, and myself, uh, Marika, uh, sit on that group uh, to try and uh, bridge the gap between the employed providers um, and people who are independent on the medical staff. And Peter, any comments from you or thoughts? comment earlier about physician isolation really um, <clears throat> kind of struck a chord with me because I, I feel like as a physician who's been in the hospital, uh, but currently I'm solely in the clinic, that there's a lot more interaction that takes place in the hospital and the clinic, yes. especially if you're in a clinic with one or two or three of your peers, it's uh, there's a little, there's much more isolation in that scenario. Mm -hmm. and, I didn't know, Di, if you, if you had any experience rolling this out into the ambulatory setting and some successes or uh, barriers that uh, are created by rolling this out into the clinic. Absolutely. We have um, in our training sessions, uh, both those that are in working in the hospital and those in primary care clinics and other clinics uh, throughout our system, similar to the um, uh, encounter between the emergency physician and the hospitalist that I described, um, same things happen uh, because we know how important that relationship is between the clinicians that are in the outpatient uh, and the inpatient, where they, um, again, because maybe of uh, meeting during training, they just they feel even more comfortable and actually look forward uh, to speaking to the, the person on the other side of the line. And I do, and we're going to wind this up here pretty quickly. And uh, Peter, I think you raise a great point. And um, for, for someone who has been doing this for a while, uh, when I started practice, uh, it was a time when primary care doctors were at the hospital every day, taking care of and managing their patients and in the lunchroom and, oh, would you go see my patient or grabbing someone in the hall? What do you think about this? And all of that has gone away. Uh, and um, I think it's a challenge. Uh, I think the other thing that's a challenge is, uh, particularly in large metropolitan um, markets, you may not know the specialists that you're referring to, like look in the directory, well, here's an orthopedist in your neighborhood, let's try that person. And you've never talked to the person. So I think there is a lot of isolation and a lot of loss because that collegiality, the ability to talk to each other, pick up the phone and, um, you know, uh, in, in the day, and I practice in a smaller town, if I had a patient with an appendix, uh, and, you know, I thought I had an appendix, rather than saying, well, why don't you go to the ER and we'll get the on-call surgeon, I would just call my friendly general surgeon and half the time they'd say, well, I'll just come over there and we'll check them out. And if it's, then we'll, we'll send them right to the OR. And so all of that's changed. And um, so Michael, I, I think if you're still on that, that's an area of how we bring the primary care folks. I don't wanna say, well, I guess I could say back to the hospital or at least back in relationship to the medical staff so that people kind of know each other, uh, work together. I think that's a huge vacuum that we have um, for primaries and frankly for specialists that they don't have that relationship with their primaries. Um, and all of that, um, when we talk about uh, well-being, professional fulfillment, uh, it's an ecosystem of all of those relationships, not just feeling better and interceding with a colleague. It's, 
It's the quality, it's the clinical voice, it's the patient experience, it's their experience. Um, it's all of those pieces. And, and so we have to think of it in a, as a continuum, not just as a, a, an initiative like, um, uh, not just an initiative like um, patient experience, for instance, or quality, uh, it, it's, it all goes together. So with that, um, I would just like to say thank you first to you, Di, um, for a great conversation and a great session for us. Uh, and, and I think this does really fit well with where we are going uh, and, and launching this um, as we start in the fall. We hope you'll uh, participate with us as, as we get this underway. I'm very much looking forward to it. And I absolutely enjoyed this today. Thank you. Thank you. And to our panelists, uh, thank you all. We appreciate you being with us, Greg, for your comments, and Barbara and Anne. Uh, uh, Ankita, thank you all. Uh, John, thank you for helping us as always. And um, uh, I would just say thanks to all the people who have joined us. I think there's a lot of concern out there for this issue, and I think it shows in our attendance. We will be um, uh, packaging this up, putting it online for folks to listen to and have their colleagues listen to, and more to come. So thank you, thank you, thanks everybody. Peter, thanks for your question, and uh, let's talk more about how we, we get to the folks who are out in clinics. I think you're absolutely right. So I hope people have a great day, a safe weekend, and uh, be well, and uh, more to come.